Welcome to NinjaCast, a photography podcast powered by Studio Ninja, the world's highest rated business management app built specifically for photographers. Listen and learn as the most successful photographers on the planet share their knowledge to help you transform every element of your photography business. Here's your host, Sally Shaw. Hi guys, welcome to NinjaCast. Today I'm joined by the lovely Jeff Brown. Now, Jeff is a bit of a marketing guru. He's run five hugely successful businesses, so there isn't much that he doesn't know when it comes to marketing your business. From branding and pricing, to making your website work for you, to growing your following, it's all things we're gonna be covering today. Let's get started. Hi Jeff, how are you doing? I'm great. And you as well, Sally? Yeah, really well, thank you. Really excited for today, actually. I think this is going to be a great one for our listeners. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself, Jeff, your career, your kind of uh, involvement in our industry so far? So so I've always been into photography since I was sort of a young lad, since about 10, 12 year old, got into photography, Mm -hmm. um, mainly through doing landscapes, because I used to go fishing and used to love taking pictures. And then... um, I had a job working for Dixon's. Do you remember Dixon's? I do remember Dixon's, Dixon's, yeah. Working on the camera department there for about a year. And then when I was 27, I joined the I joined the Royal Navy just um completely off spec one day. I, I walked past the careers office and decided I was going to join and be a chef. Wow. We were recruiting chefs at the time. So I joined as an aircraft engineer. And then once I got into the Navy, I realized you could be a Royal Navy photographer, but it's what you call a sideways entry branch. So you have to serve three years. Um, in another trade and then apply to be a photographer and, and, and literally it's such a small branch that you had to wait till somebody effectively left or died before you could be, become a photographer you know oh my gosh um, so but I, I didn't have to wait too long I waited about six months and I got accepted and, and went and did the course it's quite an intense course 28 weeks 26 exams wow past that become a military photographer um, did that for a number of years, and then um, I went to work with the intelligence services as an uh, image analysis, uh, military image analysis, doing um, analysis of like satellite imagery and um, intelligence photography. And then while I was while I was working at this place doing that, I started getting people coming into my office and um, saying, "Oh, do you do pictures of pets? Oh, my daughter's getting married, you know." And then uh, because I was land based, I was getting all these these fiddle jobs come in I thought you know what I wouldn't mind doing this as a full-time job so um there was another guy who was a photographer military photographer who was working with the intelligence services at the time and he was from Sunderland my hometown so we decided we set a business up so because Kev was married and he had two kids I wasn't at the time I came out first and I left to start the business up but at that time we got seven and a half thousand pounds from the navy to spend on training and I didn't spend their training on photography I spent it on marketing Mm-hmm. And literally within 18 months, the business was on a six-figure sum, and we were starting to open another three or four different photography businesses. So we created lots of photography niches. Um, so gone on to to run five very successful photography businesses, photographed over 750 weddings myself. Um, and then 2015, I took a bit of a change in my direction, and I ended up getting divorced, moved away to the Northumberland, to the countryside and started to um, do a lot of mentoring with other photographers who were struggling with the marketing side of the business. Mm-hmm. And that's literally taken off to the point now that I'm running a total of like 95 to 100% capacity pretty much all the way through the, the year, um, involved with quite a few other um, companies, brand ambassadors for different companies and sponsored by a few companies as well. So, And, and I just love trying to help photographers, you know, so I do lots of content for free, lots of lives, podcasts, um, just to try and really get photographers to understand the, the value of marketing in their business. Yeah, definitely. I feel like there's so much to unpack there in that <clears throat> life life story. I, for me, the first thing, like, what was it like to be a photographer in the military? Like, that must have been so different. Very different. So you, it, the people think, you know, what do, what, do you, what do you take pictures of? And you think, well, any images that you see in magazines or uh, recruitment videos or anything like that, um, was taken by it's taken by a military photographer mm-hmm. um, you know war zones are t- usually taken by military photographers as well so the, the idea of the military photographer is to save the armed forces millions and millions of pounds in advertising by creating images that they go wow I want to join up you know so it's all about painting us in a good light so not just 
um, military stuff. We do all sorts of stuff. You know, it could be one day, you could be in a helicopter with Santa Claus, you know, getting dropped into a, a school and you'll be photographing the, the military helicopter with Santa Claus and all the school kids. Wow. The next day you could be down at the polo- local police station photographing a load of Marines who've been in a fight and you're doing all the criminal injury photographs. Um, next day you could be photographing defects on um, internal engine parts on an aircraft that have to be sent off to, you know, like the, the, the manufacturers because there's a problem with it. So it was it would everything from events, royal visits, intelligence, um, still life, you know, really defects, vast. medical. Yeah, really, really vast. So what made you kind of, what made you not fall out of love with it as such? Because I guess really that mm-hmm. kind of job is so interesting that you never fall out of love with it. But what made you want that change and go, do you know what? This has been great, but now it's time for something else. I think with with anybody who served in the armed forces, the armed forces are brilliant and, you know, you, but you get to that point after, you know, probably I, I did nine years, but, you know, after about five or six, seven years ago, go by and then you start to think, I want that freedom. You know, it's, it, it's a brilliant life. It's a fantastic life. And, you know, you have it, you, you're well looked after, but end of the day, you know, somebody tells you what to do all the time. And it's like, it's, it's that ability to just work for yourself and be your own boss. And that, that's what I love the idea of. And then once I did my first few weddings and bearing in mind, you know, my, my first few weddings were like, you know, five, 600 quid. Oh. And people were paying you five, 600 quid cash. And think this is all right for you know, <laughs> five or six hours work on a Saturday. Yeah. It was the idea of how much money I could actually make as a, as a photographer. And, and I loved it. I loved the end results and seeing the brides really happy. Yeah, definitely. I guess it's quite, you know, not just um, vast changes in the work that you're doing, but, you know, the lifestyle that you're talking about there is massively different. The thing that stands out most for me, though, is, you know, I guess in the military, you have really, you are really regimented, I guess, is, you know, is the word. Someone who's on you 24-7, they want to know where you are, what you're doing, how you're doing it, Mm. and they want to see the results at the end. Um, I guess in what we do now as creative, as photographers, it's very, very you know polar opposite to that in that everything's down to you it's all under your control totally and I think that's why you know when I work with photographers on a one-to-one basis one of the parts of my program is you get so many people coming on board my program saying you know Jeff I know you know your stuff when it comes to your marketing and your branding and stuff she said but what I really want to do is join the program because I want you to kick us up the backside. Yeah. I, want, I want somebody to be accountable for and, and yeah. say, you know what? And, and, and I do have a bit of a reputation for being like that, you know, setting people targets and come on and, and leaving them voice clips. It's like, oh, you were supposed to do this by last week. Because it's real sergeant going on. Because <laughs> you, can, you can give anybody all, you know, I can give you loads and loads of tips and advice, but if that tips and advice isn't put into action, there'll be no results in the end. Yes. So, um, you know, one of the biggest takeaways from any sort of marketing is, is consistency. If you're consistently taking steps in the right direction to an end goal and you're doing the right things, small little things every single day, you will see a huge result over time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you've touched on there briefly, but, you know, marketing, it's your jam, it's your specialist subject. So yeah. I think there's a lot of listeners out there that, you know, you know me personally I completely get you know marketing is king you've got to do it you've got to do it well to be successful um, and to get where you want to be but I also think that marketing quite often you hear that word and you're just like oh gosh like I just I don't even know where to begin so what are your kind of top tips for photographers that um you know be they just starting out they want to improve their marketing from where they're at now what can they be doing well one of the first things I always say is um is niche the power of niche, the specialization. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the photography market, the photography industry as a whole, it's never been as competitive. There's more photographers now than there ever been as in the history of photography. But what most photographers do is they start off and go, right, oh, I can do this, I can do babies, I can do pets, I can, I can do headshots, I can do weddings, because the thing is they don't want to turn any particular jobs down. So they join this, this huge pool of millions of photographers from around the world where everybody else is doing the same thing. So everybody's going in as a jack of all trades. Yeah. Nobody is specialist. And if you try to appeal to everyone, you become special to no one. Mm. And the only thing you can then do to make yourself stand out is discount your prices. Mm-hmm. So what you have is at the very, very bottom end of the photography pool is all these photographers who are generalists fighting over price, where you move away from that and you still specialize. So you become a headshot photographer or a country house wedding photographer. 
or an outdoor pet photographer, and you move away from them, and then you start to serve your ideal clients, and you become very special to your ideal clients. And because you're a specialist, you can charge more money. Mm. So that is the you know the, the first biggest thing is concentrate on a particular niche. Now, you don't have to say, right, I'm just going to do weddings and I can't do headshots. You just separate your two brands. So you have a wedding brand, which is maybe quite a feminine sort of feel to it. It's very emotionally driven because it's it's an emotional style of photography. Then you have a headshot and personal branding brand, and that is what you call a solution because those people are buying for a solution to a need, and that need is usually to um, get more online publicity, make more money, grow their own business, where bride is buying for an emotional reason. So you can't communicate those two two messages through one website with one brand because both people are buying for different reasons and both people are looking for a different type and feel of brand. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's two very different um, products altogether. If you <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I would still say is, you know, we, we've got skills as photographers, so there's not, you know, I did it. I had five different photography businesses. Yes, we had, we had, seven photographers in the end and two makeup artists and there was three business partners in it but that all grew from initially me coming out first and kev following my business partner Mm -hmm. then us taking on staff then we we building the makeup business with a a makeup artist like a makeover business so you can start small and just create your niches look at where you want to spend your time what's going to be more profitable to you and then maybe create one or two different niches of photography and you could have maybe your weddings on Facebook and your headshots and personal branding goes onto LinkedIn, mm-hmm. you know? So you just build it up and it goes and goes, but specialize and focus on your clients' needs. That's the big thing. I love that. Yeah, definitely. I think ne- niching is often a, a thing that we <clears throat> get to do, isn't it? You know, we think, well, yeah. I'm a photographer. That's my, you know, that's me. That's what I do. But then that digs down so much further, doesn't it? And opens up so many other different doors. Um, that you you know you're right you kind of become a jack of all trades rather than a specialist in one Definitely. I mean from from my own business doing what I do now you know I'd, I've got about 85,000 followers follow photographer followers follow me across social media but on LinkedIn I'm Jeff Brown the photographer's mentor I, basically what I do is you know I help people brand and market mm. there's lots of branding and marketing specialists on LinkedIn but I'm not looking for all business owners on LinkedIn, I'm only looking for photographers. Yeah. So because I've niched myself down to photographers, I've become appealing to photographers. And that's why I've got 30,000 followers who are all photographers, because to them, I'm like, oh, this is the guy who helps photographers make money. He's the guru. And now I ask every one of the photographers who who joined my program, would you have joined you? Would you have come to me if my job title had just been marketer or brand specialist? And they were like, no, because I'm appealing to them. Yeah. And it's exactly the same with photography. Create your brand and build your brand, not about you, about your client and what you do for your client. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, we've we've talked about <clears throat> niche in there. So once our listeners, you know, they've they've decided they want to be a wedding photographer, they <clears throat> want to be a newborn photographer, they want yeah. to be a commercial photographer. And um, I guess the next point to that is, you know, branding and pricing strategies and where they <clears throat> fit in the market. So from yeah. from your perspective um you know as a as a business mentor as a coach what what would you say to your clients that are on that journey that you know they've they've got where they want to be in the industry what next so so you've 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 created you've decided that you want to be a wedding photographer you want to be a branding photographer then what you want to do is one thing that i I say is don't look at the competition keep away stop from from that day go forward because loads of people go ah but jeff there's somebody in my area doing weddings for 299 pounds yeah you know, there's competitors and they're not competitors. What you do is you, those people are doing you a favor. Those people are dealing with the pain in the backsides, the people who haggle about price, the people who are never satisfied, the people who want stuff for nothing. Let them deal with them and you deal with the people who have the big budgets and they want to buy something premier. So stop looking at the cheaper mass um, jack of all trades, generalist photographers. Mm-hmm. Start looking at people who you aspire to be at the people who are really top of the game in your in your your, your county, your state, wherever, mm. and look at these people. But also don't just look at them. Look at other brands that serves your ideal client. So if you're a, um, a wedding photographer, look at some of the premium wedding photography, uh, wedding dress shops, some of the premium, premium venues, mm. some of the premium bridal magazines, and you'll start to notice a similarity in colour schemes, in fonts, 
mm. in words. Likewise, if you're a brand in photography, you know, if you look at some of the the the, the companies that serve branding, like you know, uh, brand designers, website specialists, again, you will you'll notice a type of font, a, 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 a way of communication. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I, one of my clients, he's just set up as a pet photographer. I says, look at some of the outdoor brands, and also look at some of the pet related brands as well. So he 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 looked at like Barber, you know, Barber Country Wear. Yeah. You know, he was looking at things like Cher- uh, Jeep Cherokee, but also looking at some of the. The, the, the big pet companies, because what you've got to remember is those big pet companies, um, their ideal clients are your ideal clients too. Now, they've spent tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds on branding and marketing, but yet photographers feel the urge to go and copy of another photographer who spent maybe 20 quid on Fiverr getting their branding and marketing done. So somebody out there within your industry you know big businesses have already done all this for you you just have to look at their fonts their word in their color schemes and stuff and mirror that and it should be mirroring what your ideal client wants yeah definitely I mean branding mm. is a big one to tackle isn't it I think a lot of the time yeah. you know photographers can get a bit overwhelmed and you know it, it, I mean I'll be honest I didn't even do my branding myself I you know I outsourced it I got a, a brand designer in to you know this is what I've got in my head and they they brought it out on paper um but it's it definitely to look for that inspiration is massive isn't it and to see you know where you're trying to fit into the market what Mm -hmm. what are those people that you're aspiring to be look like in terms of their brand and I think when people understand what brand is you know a lot of photographers just start I think all the brands are logo right I've I've got my logo done that's it that's my brand but your brand is essentially everything you want your customers to think feel and believe about what you do Mm -hmm. And that is communicated through the images, through your message, through the style of communication, you know. So if you uh, are targeting, like I've got a, a client who targets sort of like young professional moms, you know, but when she's marketing and stuff, she's putting emojis on, she's making it quite fun and stuff. Now, somebody who's a, a business photographer won't use that same style of communication, but to her client, that's perfect because that's the way the young moms speak. And they use lots of emojis and they're, they're quite fun where somebody business wise might have a different style of communication. So your brand and your communication should mirror the way your ideal clients speak and what you want them to feel, you know, because you have to have that similarity. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, it's you know, we usually say opposites attract, <laughs> but I guess in branding, it's very much that, sim- you know, similarities. Yeah, definitely. Um, so where would you go in terms of pricing then, Jeff? You know, it's I think that's always the thing I hear time and time again is photographers struggling with where they where they sit in the market what do they charge what the, what are they mm-hmm. with well if to, to one of the big things I, I, I teach with people is is what actual price is because this is a problem right and photographers usually it's and I see this so many times right usually it's not it's photographers who are the bit one biggest enemy because they stop themselves charging what they should be charging mm-hmm. And I've had so many photographers now, you know, because I'll say to them, right, if you're going to send a quote out, are you going to do a job, contact me first, you know? And then if they're on my one-to-one program and then you know, let me get a commercial job in, I'll say, no, no way, you're not sending that out, double it yeah. and put this in and put that in and add that. So it seems like you got a lot more value. And I've had them literally petrified. And I'll say, just send the email. And they send it. And then like half an hour later, they're like, oh my God, he's booked. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, and you were going to send that out half that price. Mm -hmm. So price is actually, price is basically what a client believes is a fair exchange for the value you give. Mm -hmm. So photographers think, oh, my images aren't good enough. Your your clients aren't other photographers. They're not judging you, and they're not looking at the rule of thirds and the leading lines and stuff. Right? If, If your images are appealing to them, it goes deeper in is if your brand is appealing to them and your brand is every your brand and your value go with every single touch point from the first communication the first email the way you respond the way you come across how professional your website looks how professional your your, your brochures look right the way through till the transactional side of the sale and after the transactional side of the sale mm-hmm. um and the more you can do in that and provide value and and really because anything that has a premium price tag has a first class customer service as well. Okay. And we expect that. But if people have that, and it, what I say is, well, just don't sell your photography, sell an experience. Mm-hmm. Because anybody who has an amazing experience, whether it's even, you know, if you go out for a really nice restaurant, 
And you get, you know, you're not going to the local pub, you're getting dressed up to go out. It's a nice restaurant, the pub's really good. You go there, you get first class service when they make you feel really sort of at ease and happy and they're very, very attentive. Then you, you get like a sorbet in between courses that you weren't expecting. And then and then instead of getting mints at the end, you get these little fancy cake things, you know. And you talk about all those little extra touches that weren't part of what you actually ordered, but they came. And even though you went out and you'd spent, there was only two of you and you, you went home and you spent 150 quid or $200 on a meal, which is far more than you'd spend if you went to the local pub. That experience gives you loads of value. It was an experience and it was where the, the, the meal in the local pub, there wasn't anything, there wasn't an experience to it. You just went and had a meal. And it's about making your photography an experience, you know, making it different. Because when people value the experience, they'll pay more money for it. Definitely. I love that analogy, actually. I've never, never heard it described in that way before, but it's so right. You know, you you go out for a special occasion and you don't necessarily talk about how great the food was until right at the end. If all these other little bits and pieces that were happening through the night are yeah. what's consuming, you know, that that's what's putting a smile on your face. The fact that, you know, you had a complimentary drink or somebody came over and it was still the service or, you know, yeah. something like that. that's what makes the difference, isn't it? Um, and I think it, 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 some of the stuff, some of the stuff techniques that we tried in the studio that were just daft little things. You know, like we used to get them coming in for for makeovers. We actually had our own branded chocolate bars, and you, you could get them. Basically, it was a chocolate bar, and it, it had your branded wrapper on. You know, with simply your makeovers on. And when people came in, they got a, a one of those with a cup of tea and other coffee, and they're like, "Wow, this is this is, this is different." But then after the shoot and everything, what we do, we'd always hold something back. And this was kept in our price in our packages anyway. They just didn't know they were going to get it. Mm. So we'd over deliver at every point. So we'd say, well, we should have your, we should have your pictures ready within within 10 days. The pictures will be ready within three. Mm. So they're like, oh, they, we'd set them up to expect 10 and then over delivered by producing them in three. But we knew we were going to deliver them in three in the first place. Yeah. Then after they got their images or they get their wall art. Maybe a week later, we would send them out something in the post, which might be something as simple as a couple of free key rings with images of their children on in a fridge magnet. Mm -hmm. And the messages we got that back from that little gift, because they thought that transaction between us and them had finished. And then we went and we'd had the money off them. We'd done our job, but we went out of our way to do something extra that you don't get that, do you? You don't, when you purchase off a store or, or something, you don't get something afterwards. That try, so we just did that little thing, that extra transactional thing. And that was our key point then after doing that, to drop them a message and say, I know you had a fantastic time. I'm just wondering if you would do a testimonial for the website. The testimonials will go back with phenomenal because, yeah. but what did it cost us to do that? $15, $20, 10 pounds, you know, yeah. not much money at all, but it made a massive difference. Definitely. I guess that, <clears throat> that branding kind of, um, that whole experience feeds back into your website as well. I mean, that's, it's the first place that, um, you know, a lot of potential clients or inquiries are going to see you. It's the first place that they're going to find you, or at least the first place that they're going to find out more information about you. Yeah. So I know, I mean, websites is a, it's, <clears throat> it's a, a ninja cast episode on its own. <laughs> But I mean, in terms of your website, how can people make sure that, you know, what they've decided on with their niche, what they've decided on with their branding and their pricing structure, how can they reflect all that in their website so that, you know, do they say something like, you know, you make an assumption on a business or a person within so so many seconds? How, you know, how do you get that client to think, oh, no, this is some someone I want to find some, out some more about? So basically, you have a thing called um, <clears throat> above the fold, which is which is the first part of your website that comes up, whether it's on a mobile phone or whether it's on a laptop. Mm -hmm. And that instantly should communicate who you are and what you do for the client, not what you do as in wedding photographer, what you do for the client. So you produce beautiful wedding day images that are hassle-free and um, unobtrusive. Mm -hmm. you know, so you can enjoy your beautiful day uh, every you know, every tear, every emotion, every laugh is captured, mm -hmm. but in a very intrusive, unobtrusive way, allowing you to enjoy your wedding day without feeling like you've got this photographer yeah. following you around all the time. So that beginning bit should communicate straight away with your client. Because what you've got to think is when a client comes to your website, 
they've been to loads of other photographers' websites, whether it's personal branding, whether it's photography, whether it's wedding photography, newborn, whatever. Mm-hmm. The reason they've come to yours, if they've been to other p- people's, is because the previous websites hadn't hadn't communicated what they wanted to hear, yeah. hadn't answered their question. And what will happen is they'll go from photographer's website to photographer's, which is usually a gallery type of website, portfolio type, that doesn't communicate. And then they land on yours and you straight, straight, straight away say, I understand your problem. I understand what you're worrying about. You, you, you're a bride, you're going to be getting married. You, you, you hate having your photograph taken, but you want beautiful pictures of your wedding day. So your website talks about putting somebody at ease, making them capturing every moment and that sort of stuff. So whatever you, you if you're a personal brand and you talk about, I'll help you create the best attention grabbing images of yourself. So you create the perfect first impression to mm-hmm. anyone within, within three seconds of you in it, you know, the best headshot. So you communicate that problem straight away at the very beginning. Then your website, depending on what style of photography you do, your website should only have one purpose. So if you imagine that scroll on your website has one purpose. Now, if it's, if it's wedding photography, it's going to be a consultation. If it's personal branding, it's going to be a consultation. If it's something like portrait photography, it might be just to book a session. So depending on whether it's a high value ticket option mm. or a lower value ticket option, where with obviously portraits, the session fees smallish or headshots, the session fees smallish, but the, the money comes after the session when people are buying more images. Mm. The purpose of that website is to get people to just book a session. Yes. So get them excited, get them to book a session. If it's wedding photography, you can't get somebody to come onto your website and book you as a wedding photographer without first answering some, some questions. Yeah. So what you do is the purpose of that website is to get them to have a, a free, no obligation consultation. So your website is either get them book a session if it's low cost, if it's higher ticket, like personal branding, commercial photography or weddings, it's to book that consultation to find out more, to answer their questions. Because once you can get them off the website, and speaking to you on person or on a Zoom, then that's when you create relationships and that's when you can pull them over and tell them a bit more about you. So your website needs to be pretty much straight to the point because they're only going to hang around for two or three minutes. Mm. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? It's, you, you don't get yeah. long to create that first impression. I mean, you get the odd, um, you, you, there'll be photographers out there that's had the odd book in where, you know, I've had, <laughs> I think I've had one or two across my career where they've come into my inbox, they've said, we'd really like to book you. How much do you charge? You've sent back your information how much you charge let's book mm-hmm. in a consultation and the next email you have back is no great that that's but like you know let's book um here's the yeah. deposit let's go and it's like yeah. you know wonderful <laughs> if only all bookings could be like that yeah but yeah you're definitely right you know it's it's that there's much more relationship building in a high ticket item isn't there it's more about mm-hmm. investing in their emotions rather than just getting that exchange of money yeah yeah totally and i know that, that that's what i do with mine you're my website my, my program is £1,500. I don't expect any photographer to come to my website and say, Jeff, can I jump on your program yeah. without first speaking to me? So my website drives people to have a, a free 30-minute consultation call. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, there's there's listeners probably, um, you know, they've, they've got this far into the episode and they're going, you know, this is great. I'm ticking things off as we're going through. I've done this. I'm happy with this there might be people that just want a bit more traction in the industry. They want to be seen more. They want to be noticed more within, you know, their customer base. And um, mm-hmm. they want to increase increase their following, their inquiries, that side of things. So, you know, let's say, you know, they're doing all right with branding. They're doing all right with them or they think they're doing all right with their marketing. Um, yeah. what, what can they do to shake things up a little bit? Not necessarily a whole start from fresh, but just to, to refresh what they're doing now. One of the biggest things that I think... Um, <clears throat> is this word and I've just been working on a, a photographer's journal that I've put together and it's, it's it's basically goal setting, consistency, and the final thing that most people forget about is what's called opportunity. Mm-hmm. So opportunity is going the other way, reaching out, and not many photographers do this. Mm-hmm. So we all have skills and um, experience that we can share with loads of other people. So what you want to do is you, there's loads of other people who already serve your ideal clients who might be interested in the skills and experience that you have. So what you need to do is maybe start creating a, a, what I call an opportunity list. Mm-hmm. So say, for instance, you're a, um, a wedding photographer. Yes, you can start approaching venues and try and get in with wedding venues and wedding coordinators. You can start approaching bridal shops. Funny enough, one of the best um, incentive I had was a commission-based referral scheme with 
bridal shops. And every single bridal shop who sent us somebody with a special voucher that we created. So I didn't say put leaflets out. There was no leaflets put out. These vouchers were kept under the counter when a woman come in to try on a wedding dress. The girl would say, oh, have you got a photographer? Oh, no, I haven't. Oh, can I? I'll recommend you one. And he's a special VIP voucher. And if I mention my name, you get £100 off. So she would write her name on, hand that to the bride. Bride would come and see us. And if they booked, a week later, I'll pop in to see the girl in the shop and give her £100 in cash. Mm-hmm. So a young girl who's maybe 18, 20 year old, and I go in and pay her £100. She's like, wow, what's this for, Jeff? Yeah. You passed free on over to us last week. What are you going to do the next time somebody comes in the shop? He's going to, oh. and, and sometimes we will, you know, we'd be paying some girl maybe three, four hundred pounds a month, and all she had to do was mention our name. Mm-hmm. And that one bridal shop got us about 32 bookings. Wow. But that was looking out, you know, in just one year, that was looking out for opportunities. So mm. look at other people who serve your niche. It might be a, a wedding photography blogger or a wedding photography magazine that you can say, well, I can create some top tips or I can write you a guide on how to have a stress-free wedding morning because in your experience photographing two or three hundred weddings you know what can possibly go wrong on the morning so you could write a tip for brides so it's about positioning yourself as an authority what you want to do is start positioning yourself as what i call the go-to photographer Mm -hmm. start thinking outside the box you know for your food photographer contact some celebrity chefs contact some food bloggers contact food magazines try and get some partnerships going and sharing mutual information and tips because this is something i do on a regular basis with big companies with podcasts and you know what the the, what's the worst thing people can say is no but you when you start doing it you'd be surprised how many people go oh that's a good idea jeff should we should we have a zoom Mm -hmm. and and that's what i get my clients to do you know i say do it approach somebody and then they'll be like oh they said yes yeah well don't be so surprised you know because (laughs) the reason being is because that's unusual because most other photographers aren't doing that. Mm. It's looking beyond and using that, using other people's authority to increase your authority and also work directly with the clients you want to work with. I love that. It's it's trying to, um, I guess, when everyone else is stepping left, you step right. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's doing, doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing, isn't it? And you know the best bit about it? It doesn't cost you anything. It costs you literally 10, 15 minutes of your time. I have a, in this new journal that I put together, I've created a day and I call it Opportunity Wednesday. And I say like, you know, Wednesday morning, before you do anything else, before you open up Lightroom or you open up social media, send out those emails, make that phone call, send out those connection messages on LinkedIn to these people who you want to maybe do some sort of joint venture with. Mm -hmm. And just send out two or three. It takes you 15 minutes, just do it. That could be one of the best emails you ever send. Mm. Are the best phone calls you've ever made because something comes from it. And I've seen it. I'm not just saying this. I've seen it happen for so many of the people I work with. And it, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get. And the worst they can say is no. Yeah. You know, they're not going to be uh, not going to be abusive. They're not going to be horrible to you. They just come to arms. I'm sorry, Sally, we're not interested. Yeah. But thanks for asking. And that's it. Simple. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, you've you've mentioned that a couple of times through the um through the interview, Jeff, and it's something that we've not actually touched on is LinkedIn. So I know you know your stuff when it comes to LinkedIn. And I think a lot of people bypass the platform. You know, it's not as as heavily used as the likes of Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, even um, for our um, our industry as such photographers, um, Mm. which is madness, right? Totally. And I I can give you some really interesting statistics. So uh, LinkedIn, um, the current uh, user amount on LinkedIn. So there's 775 million active users on, on LinkedIn. There's two new LinkedIn accounts created every second. Wow. Uh, 41% of millionaires use LinkedIn and the average wage earner on LinkedIn earns £77,000 a year. So these oh, yeah. are <laughs> <laughs> so these are people with big money. So the, the, the age demographics is the highest pop- population demographic, 60%, is from the 24 to 35 age group so think weddings think babies think portraits right but there's also older generations on there whose kids are getting married Mm -hmm. who have pets who also want personal branding and headshot photography so these people buy from people who they 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 like and who um they interact with within the platform Mm -hmm. this is the, the the most powerful bit 775 million people there's only 30 million what you call fully optimized profiles Mm -hmm. Um, and when I work with people, that's one of the things we do, fully optimize the profile so you start sending out. 
But the next most important thing is the entire newsfeed content in LinkedIn, everything you see in LinkedIn is created by less than 1% of those 775 million people. Wow. So unlike Facebook and Instagram, you're not struggling to get heard. All you've got to do is show up, post 16 times a month is what LinkedIn calls content creation. Mm -hmm. So your average post on LinkedIn can actually trend for anything up to about two weeks. So it's not a heavy work platform. Mm -hmm. You just need to be you know, creating content maybe four times a week, five times a week. And get yourself out there because only 1% of the people are doing it. Now, what happens is a lot of people create content on LinkedIn and they don't get much engagement. Mm. And then they go, oh, well, that's that's pretty crap. Now, what you want to do is you want to have a look at the views. So you put a post out, the post might get 2,000 views or 1,500 views when you first start off. I get tens of thousands of views on mine. But the interaction is very, very small. You might get one like. Now, a view means somebody's clicked that post open and, and read it or looked at it. Mm. I get so many people message me and say, Jeff, I'm really interested in joining your program. I've been following you for about three months now on LinkedIn or six months. And I look at this person and think, you've never liked a single one of my posts. You've never <laughs> commented. I don't know who you are. I jump on the phone and they go, oh, yeah, I follow everything you do. I say, yeah, I've never seen you like anything or comment. Oh, because I'm a bit frightened to. And that's the thing with LinkedIn. Lots of people have these accounts, but they're, they're scared to interact because LinkedIn users are quite shy. But what they're doing is they're digesting and consuming your content in the background and you're standing out. Mm. And it's so don't be disheartened by the likes because likes is only vanity anyway. It's the engagements and the views that that potentially lead to the um, lead to the sales. It's keeping up that consistency, you know, four times, four times a week, get used to that. And the results are tremendous. I have so many amazing client success stories just from LinkedIn across all niches. Um, but I would say probably about 80% of the photographers I work with make most of their money from LinkedIn. I definitely need to get on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I'm, it I'm 100% one of these photographers that isn't, yeah. isn't, well, I think I've got a profile somewhere. I couldn't yeah. even tell you the last time I looked at it. Um, so I'm definitely one of those, you know, one of those people that we're talking about where we say, you know, that LinkedIn's massive and we're not using it. Well, it's, it, you know, the biggest professional networking platform on the planet. It's owned by Microsoft. Microsoft paid something like $26 billion for it. Um, and they have a projected user base of $2 billion, So that's where they want to get to. So they're putting loads and loads of money into LinkedIn. Mm. You've probably seen there's LinkedIn TV ads and LinkedIn radio ads. You know, no other social media network you advertising on radio and TV telling people and they join. So it, it is a very powerful platform. Um, and Microsoft wouldn't spend $26 billion on buying the platform if they didn't want to invest in it and, mm. and make it worthwhile and every single photographer I work with and I can say this 100% every single photographer I work with none of them have paid us a penny on LinkedIn ads this is all done organically mm -hmm. right so you can get onto LinkedIn you don't need a, a premium LinkedIn profile use the free one in fact I would recommend you don't buy a premium profile yeah never pay for LinkedIn ads just get a fully optimized profile, produce content three or four times a week. Speak the same way as you would on Facebook. Don't be afraid to just be yourself, be authentic. You don't have to talk in a different language because you're on LinkedIn. Mm. Tell stories. People love stories and you will get noticed and people will come to you and it won't cost you a penny to do business. Yeah, that's what we all aim for, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but, you know, that. all these things about reaching out and this opportunity, mm. that's the best place to find opportunity if you want to work with other businesses because these are, you can straight away, you can say, I could say, right, well, I want to I want to maybe do a podcast with Studio Ninja or do something or be an ambassador, right? I'll type in, so I go up to the search, type in Studio Ninja and then all the staff who's on there yeah. would come up and I'll oh, there's a CEO, I'll connect with him and send him a message. So the good thing about LinkedIn, you know, if you wanted to drop a message to Richard Branson, you could actually inbox him if yeah. you wanted. You don't have to go through gatekeepers. You can connect with anybody you want. That's madness, isn't it? Like, so it you is, yeah. the platform. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you couldn't do that on Facebook, you know, so. No, certainly not, certainly not. I think, I, I guess for me, I've always thought of LinkedIn as like the, the professional person's Facebook like a business, yeah. a business professional's equivalent to Facebook. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're spoiled really with so many different platforms out there now, aren't we, social media-wise, that it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to 
to pick out which one's going to be best for you. But um, I'm definitely going to have a look at LinkedIn. So I'm sure our, our listeners will after all those statistics because that's a bit mind blowing. And if you look at some of the, you know, I, I have a, I do sort of like 80, 20 or 60, 40 sort of rule with my posting. So I give out loads of valuable content. So, you know, tips and advice. And I do LinkedIn lives every every week with new, mm. new guests coming on. But then if you look at some of the stuff I posted last week, I, I put a po- post of um, my daughter and myself for Halloween dressed up as um, Slash and Axel from Guns N' Roses now. This Love is this <laughs> and the hat and stuff like that, you know. Um, and that got like 100 and odd likes and comments yeah. and loads of interaction. So, you know, people like to see what people yeah. are doing. People yeah. buy from people who they like, you know. So you, be yourself, you know, post some of your landscapes, post pictures of your dog, post what you've had for your tea or what you baked in the kitchen and tell a story about it yeah I love that that's fantastic if you could start your career all over again Jack is there Mm. anything you'd do differently anything you thought I wish I knew that before um I suppose not really no because there's a lot of you know I made a lot of mistakes and some very expensive mistakes as well and one, one of my biggest most expensive mistakes related to my business um in 2014, I decided it would be a brilliant idea to buy a food pub mm-hmm. um, that had a huge, big um, sort of like restaurant and functional room on the side, and it was going to be a wedding venue. Um, so I spent about 160000 on that, and I lost the entire lot within 12 months. Oh, God. And then I suffered from depression for about six months afterwards. It re- I really took a, a big bash from that. But that, that big failure... Um, created the, the mentoring businesses I've got now and changed the direction, you know. So six, seven years from that has produced, I wouldn't have ended up on this direction if it hadn't been for that. Yeah. I probably yeah. might have still been in that pub stressed a bit and trying to run the wedding wedding business and do the wedding photography and everything else. And so, and I think, you know, thinking back to some of the portrait stuff, you ran a radio advertising campaign for four grand and got one inquiry. Mm-hmm. you know so yeah but you learn by your mistakes I think every mistake I've, I've done has been a learning curve and I've managed to get something out of it yeah definitely if anything just to not do it again you know? yeah absolutely each path you take yeah. leads you to where you are now right so yeah, yeah yeah definitely I love that if you could add a final piece of advice for our listeners Jeff something um that's made a big difference to your life personally or your business life kind of the golden nugget takeaway if you like for today what would that be I think the biggest thing is consistency. Mm-hmm. It is, and it doesn't have to be massive. It's just developing that routine. And I think from photographers, you know, photographers who, who, photographers actually, they only think about marketing when, when the work starts to dry up. Absolutely. It's usually a rule, you know, and it's like, and then then they're like, oh Christ, I need to do me mad, and I've got no bookings in. Mm-hmm. But you, you don't, marketing doesn't have, it's not an eight hour thing every single day. You know, marketing can be as little as 15, 20 minutes every single day. But what I say is, you know, get up on the morning before you open your emails, before you switch on Lightroom, do one little bit of marketing, write 250 words towards a blog post that you're going to publish at the end of next week. Um, get your social media post out. Go on to LinkedIn and connect with 30 potential clients. Mm-hmm. Just do those little things because these all add up. It's like going to the gym. You know, you don't go to the, you don't go to the gym and do a two-hour session, really beast yourself, and then come out ripped to bits full of muscles, you know. If, but if, you, go, <laughs> if you go 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes a day, three or four times a week, yeah. in two months' time, your mates will be going, oh, have you been working out? Mm-hmm. You know, have you lost weight? So it's just those little things, you know. Yeah, definitely. That's great. If our listeners would like to get in touch, pick your brains, have a chat with you, <clears> find out more about, you know, the coaching and marketing side of your business that you do, how can they get in touch with you? So the website is the photographersmentor.com. Mm-hmm. And then they can also contact me on LinkedIn. If you're on LinkedIn, uh, just head over to LinkedIn, just Jeff Brown, the photographer's mentor, drop me a connection request. And I, I always answer questions. I don't, um, I have this thing is, you know, if you're interested in my program or even if you just want a bit of advice, I'll, I'll always respond. And if you want a free 30 minutes business consultation, come on, I'll give you the free 30 minutes consultation. I'll give you a brochure, then decide if you want to join my program or not. I don't do sales. That's not the way I work. Yeah. Definitely. I love that. Fantastic. Well, this has been an absolute breath of fresh air. I've loved every single second. I've learned tons. 
<laughs> just on my it's brilliant it's been absolutely lovely so thank you so much for carving out the time in your busy schedule to come and uh, have that chat with us um hopefully we'll be able to catch each other again soon brilliant thanks very much lovely. thanks jeff See you Sally. Bye, bye everyone bye now Okay, guys, that's everything from me today. Thank you so much again to Jeff for coming and joining us on the show and really digging deep into his marketing knowledge with us. If you'd like to see the show notes, you can head to www.studioninja.co forward slash episode 46. Please, as always, don't forget to rate us on the podcast platform that you're listening on. A little bit of love goes a very long way. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of NinjaCast, brought to you by Studio Ninja. Beautifully designed and super easy to use, Studio Ninja will help you manage your leads, clients, shoots, invoices, contracts, workflows, and so much more. To learn more or start your 30-day free trial, go to www.studioninja.co.